We'll be back here on stage and we've got a great studio audience here at uh, Cast Tech High. And so let's go to the first question. Hi, ma'am, what's your name? I'm Sherry Wells and I just read the new law for the third grade reading and I want to know if everyone really is going to be prepared to do that. Teachers know who's having problems reading. It's got too many tests in there. Mm -hmm. It does have the whole community involved. Is it going to be funded? And, and is it going to succeed without flunking kids? Thanks so much for the question. And you're talking about, of course, uh, the new legislation that was passed saying that if a child is below the third grade reading level by one grade, that they should be held back um, and not um, graduate on to the next grade. But Troy, I'm gonna let you answer that. Veronica, excuse me. Yes. Um, so a couple of things I think need to be understood. The first thing is that this doesn't go into effect until 2019, 2020. Um, I think that it is incumbent on all of us who support schools, who work with schools, to really look at reading intervention programs that are working effectively and help teachers and support them in the development of those reading intervention programs. Because without that implementation, we're not going to succeed. Uh, it is important that every child read. I also think that third grade is too late. Early childhood is extremely important on this issue. If we don't have word development and play and all of the things that expose our young students to be able to successfully read by the third grade, uh, we're, not, we're also not gonna get there. So we need both funding and support around early childhood and support around reading intervention in one, two, three. Does anyone else wanna pick up on that real quick before yeah, we go to the next that, question? It's actually Hi, disturbing that, um, that when you think about it happens in 2019, people see that and they say, oh, we're gonna finally deal with this issue when you're really not. And that means that we've lost three more years. And so just recently we joined uh, with public council to support students who are actually suing on their own behalf. Um, the fact that literacy is a basic building block of education. And even in this context, we don't get it right. Um, the fact that many of our schools and our children in Detroit don't have books to take home. And so how do you uh, begin to address literacy when we don't even have books for our students? So I think there's a lot of frustration. I listened to a parent tell a story about how her daughter is a, uh, a high achieving student, uh, gets a 4.0. She takes copious notes and she takes pictures of pages because she is determined to do well in school. But it's not fair that she has to come up with a stopgap measure for her own education versus taking that same ingenious and being able to go deeper in her subject. So this is a major issue in 2019 is not sufficient. And it's gonna take resources. Let's go to the next question. Hi, sir, what's your name? Gene Cunningham. Okay, go ahead, and what's your question? I'd like to know how much money from the state school aid fund is being used to subsidize economic development in the city's tax increment finance area. Well, that is my, maybe a question that we can't um, particularly answer here on this panel, and we're going to have to um, maybe take that for a, a larger discussion about uh, economics. So let's go to our next question. Sir, what's your name? Hi, my name is Ishmael Ahmed. Hmm. I'm a candidate for the State Board of Education. Okay. Early education is fundamental, uh, and also parenting programs, mm -hmm. but they're not universal in Michigan. Mm -hmm. What can we do to move that ahead? Tanya, I'm going to let you handle that. What do you think that we can do to make those programs more universal for early childhood? Uh, it's really simple. We just need to invest. <laughs> I mean, it, it has to be a decision. I think one of the things that um, Nolan said at the beginning of the program is that our state is not a education state. It's not an education state. We're not investing. Uh, many of the states, even though we've increased our early childhood investments overall, it's not enough. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, there are programs that are available in every single school district across the state. And we also need to make sure that parenting programs are available to uh, these families. And when you talked about the third, gr re third grade reading, I would just lift up that they're not really financing that support. Mm -hmm. Now we know schools need to do a good job at that, but why are we pe penalizing the children because mm -hmm. we have a broken education system across the state? So we gotta take a more holistic look at this and really do the investments that we need that we know will give these kids the right building blocks. Is it, is it in terms of we've gotta reprioritize some of our funding or put it in different places? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I would say so. I mean, so one of the things the gentleman just asked about financing, part of it is that we're now taking um, higher ed funding out of our uh, state aid budget. 
Now, that was never the case, and it never should have been the case. We need to be able to finance, figure out how we're going to finance both and prioritize those things. If we wanted to get rid of maybe investing so heavily in prisons, that would give us some room in our budget. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. Hi, ma'am, what's your name? Marley, Marty Wilson. Okay, Marty. Um, my question is, you discussed a relation, an importance of the re relationship between a student and the teacher. I want to know what advice do you have for a parent whose daily conversation with their child is, my teacher isn't there, I don't have a teacher, or my teacher left for a better opportunity in another district. Charlotte, I'm gonna let you take that. Ooh, and it's very frustrating. It's the very thing that we dealt with last school year with lots of transition of teachers and, and children not being able to bond appropriately with their teacher. And I would say if that is a condition of your school, honestly, I have to answer how to answer for my kid. Take your kid and move them. Um, to a place where they're going to be able to develop relationships and bond and have all the conditions that we want as parents for our kids to be successful, not knowing who your teachers are. Kid, kids know when they're getting the short end of the stick. They're articulating to you now, mommy, this isn't working. I don't even know who I can connect to. And so that is a moment where parents have to act. We are champions for our children. We have to make a decision to say, hey, let me get you out of that environment because they don't know what to do, but they know enough to tell you what's, what's not happening. And so I would say look at, um, there are a number of schools in Detroit who are doing a good job. Um, Excellent Schools Detroit pr produces um, a whole report card around schools who are getting these kinds of conditions right. And I think it's worth taking a look at that and figuring out how to get your kid in a place where they know who their teacher is. All right, and we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. And we're going to kind of finish up our show. I'm going to leave our panel here and head back over to uh, Nolan and Steven as we uh, wrap up our live show here on education Welcome. at Cast Tech. I know we haven't uh, we haven't had a chance to be together this uh, <laughs> this entire show. Well, I've been very busy. All right, Nolan, I want to talk to you a little bit about the takeaway from tonight and some of the things that we've heard. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, I still think I still go back to what we said in the, be the beginning. There are promising things going on in education in Detroit and in Michigan, but there are a tremendous amount of challenges and we've got to commit to meet meeting the challenges and we've got to commit to a one state approach to reforming education. That's what's working in other places. We don't have that here. We need it. Okay, so I go back and say, all right, who's in charge then? Who's that person who's supposed well, to go and do that part one of the approach? Problem. That's part, yeah, it's part of the problem. We've got both a governor in charge of education and a state board in charge of education, a state school superintendent. My solution would be to put the responsibility under the elected governor, make the education um, a board a department under the state, and, and give him the accountability. If it works or doesn't work, it's on him. All right, Stephen, thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, the discussion about Detroit and the upcoming election, how pivotal that is, how important that is to making this new reset work, uh, that's everything. That's only, what, six weeks away, so. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, we're, we'll uh, look forward to getting to know some of the candidates yeah. and, uh, and going from there. All right, thanks, guys. And that is going to do it for this special live broadcast of My Week. Thanks so much for joining us. As always, you can find us during the week on Facebook and on Twitter. And for all of us at Detroit Public Television, I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next time for My Week. Take care, and thanks to our audience here tonight. Thanks. <laughs>